Good evening. My name is Steve Seitz. I'm the host of Book Talk, and we've got a special treat for, you, for the viewers tonight. In the first place, this is a two-part episode. I'll be talking with three different authors who have one thing in common, and they have a thing in common with me, and that is that they all write new Sherlock Holmes stories. I took Book Talk on the road to Atlanta, Georgia, the first weekend in April, for the uh, annual 221B convention, which is dedicated to all things Sherlock Holmes. I participated in a number of panels, and I met a number of colleagues, and met some fans, and sold some books, and it was just great. This episode, we're going to be talking to one of the authors I met there. Her name is Lindsay Fay. Lindsay is a great personality. She is one of the Baker Street Babes, a fan group that does weekly podcasts. And she is the author of Dust and Shadow, the, uh, in which Sherlock Holmes tracks down Jack the Ripper, and we'll be talking about that. Our next episode, part two, will feature authors Amy Thomas and Eddie Webb. Amy writes novels, and Eddie writes criticism, and we'll learn more about them in the next episode. But now we're going to go to Atlanta to uh, Book Talk and author Lindsay Fay. Hope you enjoy it. Um, this, per this particular program, we'll be talking about Sherlock Holmes, and among us Sherlockians, there's a specific sense of t a specific terminology. It's like, like any other profession, we've got our jargon too. So when you hear references to the canon, the canon refers to the original stories and novels by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes as written by the original author. A great hiatus occurred when Conan Doyle got sick of Sherlock Holmes and killed him off in 1894, but brought him back 10 years later in a new series of stories. And so that period between the end of Holmes' supposed death and his return from the dead 10 years later is known as the Great Hiatus. Holmes was thought to have died at the Reichenbach Falls, so that's why we refer to things as the hiatus, and the post-hiatus and the post-Reichenbach period. And that's the basic grasp of it. If you haven't read the Sherlock Holmes stories, you should, because they are, above all else, a lot of fun to read. You won't have any trouble understanding them. You'll enjoy them. You'll, you know, it's one of the best reading experiences anybody will ever have. And don't judge a book by its movie, okay? I mean, that's generally true. But just because you've seen, you know, a few Sherlock Holmes TV shows doesn't mean you're getting the real character. By all means, go to the originals, and then you can, then you can really appreciate what the rest of us are trying to do. And appreciate the broad scope of imagination that really Sherlock Holmes sparks. So thanks for bearing with me, and the rest of the show will come along in a few moments. Well, fanboy Steve here. I am with Lindsay Fay, who is a well-known Sherlockian author like myself, and also the head of the Baker Street Babes. Christina Minenti is the head of the Baker okay. Street Babes, but I am one of the Baker Street Babes, definitely. Okay. And Lindsay's one of the Baker Street Babes. And Oh, well. No, you don't. <laughs> anyway. This handsome gentleman <laughs> and I are probably going to interview each other, don't you think? Yes, I think we are. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. So, but, but this all comes down, of course, to, to Sherlock Holmes. So tell, tell me a little bit about how Sherlock came into your life and where, where he took you. Sherlock Holmes, uh, oh, where he took me. Goodness, what a great way to phrase that question. That's actually a much better way to phrase that question than uh, I've ever been asked before. Um, Sherlock Holmes, initially, I think I um, was out of Nancy Drew's stories, and I said to my dad, uh, I'm bored, uh, bored, 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 and I would like to read something um, that is also in the mystery genre, and he said, why don't you read this short story called The Speckled Band, and I always think that that is actually a very interesting way to come to the canon, because if you, you can take the adventures and the memoirs, etc. all the sh short stories, you can take them very episodically, and you can just take them like one at a time. Yeah. You don't have to do them chronologically at all, because they're not chronologically based. Yeah. Doyle, right. Doyle gave zero shits about <laughs> all of that. Yeah. And then, so I didn't start with The Study in Scarlet, I started with Speckled Band, and then I was like, oh my god, I have to read everything about Sherlock Holmes. So um, I always describe it as, I'm one of those people who, um, after reading Sherlock Holmes, never stopped mm -hmm. reading Sherlock Holmes. 
So there are people who read Sherlock Holmes and like, oh, I just read all of those stories and I understand the answers to the cases and the you know clues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I never stopped reading them at all because I, I just wanted to live in that world with them um, mm -hmm. continually. I know, I, I, wrote, I wrote down one of the, uh, the first volume of Les Klinger's Annotated. Yep, yeah. I bought at Costco when I was, um, I think I was 15, Costco had the um, William S. Berry Gould. Uh, that, that was the best 15 bucks I ever spent. I bought, I, got, I bought that in 1971. I was obsessed the with that edition, like, because it had so much stuff, you know, that like it's uh, peripheral to the world and, mm -hmm. you know, like. Well, that taught me the value of research. Yes, research is important. <laughs> Keep that in mind, writers out there. Research is important. You yes, can't everyone. just make it up. Yeah. Well, if you do make it up, then at least have the decency to be in the fantasy genre or yeah. the sci-fi genre so that you can make it up and it will believe you as opposed to making up things that didn't actually happen. Yeah, exactly. And at what point did you start writing? Oh, well, uh, weirdly, it was, <clears throat> I was homeschooled when I was a kid, when I was really young, and we, um, for fun, my brother and I, I would just, uh, write plays and cast him in them and they would be they would tend to be things of, about you know uh, the Chronicles of Narnia and he would be you know I put him in his little I'm like okay here's my brother this is like a doll that I have <laughs> so I I took Elmer's glue and I glued cotton balls on his chest and I made him Mr. Tumnus <laughs> from Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe wasn't a very nice thing to do. Um, so I think that in terms of Sherlock Holmes, yeah, I started writing Sherlock Holmes when I was very young. And um, I always like the story that Michael Shaven has about writing Sherlock Holmes. Where, uh, uh, if you haven't read Maps and Legends, anybody who's listening to this, um, Maps and Legends is an amazing essay collection that Michael Shaven uh, put together about, uh, he's the author of The Amazing Adventures of Catherine and Clay, etc. Yeah, this so, The Final Solution. The Final Solution, which is Sherlockian in nature, and um, the Yiddish Policeman's Union, nominated for an Edgar Award. He's uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and he's ridiculously amazing. So I would say um, Telegraph Avenue, you know. So all of these things, he's awesome. He, when he was 10, read the Sherlock Holmes mysteries and wrote what he thinks is a shitty Sherlock Holmes pastiche. I bet it's awesome. I'm sure it is. I bet it's completely awesome. Um, but he he makes the argument that you would never write anything if you didn't admire something first. Of course. And I think that that is a very beautiful way to look at it. Yes, I think you're right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's what I was doing when I was when I was uh, preteen. I was, you know, writing I was writing Sherlock Holmes mysteries and you know, Narnia stories and all of that stuff, and I was just making my brother put on the costumes. <laughs> in my, I've been writing all my life as well. In fact, when I was in college, I wrote easily the worst novel ever written, but I researched it to, it to the last detail. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Well, if you're going to write a bad novel, you might yeah. as well research it. <laughs> I, 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 might, I might dig it up. The original idea is still good, but I, I just wasn't. Actually, it didn't become good until I met my, until I met my wife. Yeah, I've done this sort of thing too, where I'm like, oh man, I had a great idea. Will was that shittily executed. Yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah, same. <laughs> well, yeah, well, she, she was, my, my wife is, is an English professor. Uh -huh. And I knew lots of stuff from just reading and reading and reading, but she knew the actual rules. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, and she, and she, and, you know, she's evaluating bad writing all the time because she teaches college. Because English. that's the thing that she does. Yeah. Yes. So I didn't really She's learn in how. Fact to, paid for that thing. Yeah. So I didn't really write anything worth reading until I met her, and then of course, I think I told you the story about my my Plague of Dracula manuscript. Yes. Yeah, I sent that to a, a professional editor. Plug for Jean Cavalos, by the way. If you need anything work, worked on, Jean Cavalos, she's perfect. Not particularly kind, but. <laughs> well, you don't want kindness in a no, person who's fixing your shit. No, you, <laughs> no, you really don't. <laughs> And you know, she, you know, she, she was fair. She was fair, but pointed out these gigantic logic holes that never occurred to me. Mm -hmm. And in turn, that made the whole book better. Yep. 
the you took on the other great villain. There, there are two. I should explain that there are two, two kinds of villains that are irresistibly attracted to, to uh, Sherlock Holmes pastiche writers. I went for Dracula, the one I knew best. Some of us go for Dracula. Mm -hmm. So, for the benefit of those who have yet to read your book, what approach did you take? Well, the approach that I took is actually kind of an eccentric one. Um, I knew. I'm going to flatter myself in the sense that I am an obsessed enough nerd that I knew quite a bit about Sherlock Holmes before I ever approached writing Dustin Jada. Um, I know the difference between a dog cart and a hansom. That's not a problem for me. Mm -hmm. um, I know the difference between a shilling and a guinea. I can tell you from uh, Toby the dog and Pompey the dog. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have some street cred there. But I knew nothing about Jack the Ripper. So, this is where I became the ignoramus, and I just relied on other people uh, to help me. I did an enormous amount of research into Jack the Ripper. Um, apart from doing my own research into Jack the Ripper, I was helped by extraordinarily kind Ripperologists, and if anybody has ever thought that Sherlock Holmes fans are really, really, oh, really yeah. um, obsessed. obsessed about detail, Ripperologists are right up there. So I'm talking to Stuart P. Evans. I'm talking to Donald Rompolo. Wow, you did that. Like, yeah, I talked to all of them, and I talked to them because they believed that I was taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. And so I'm emailing Donald Rompolo and Stuart P. Evans and these folks who know way more things about the Ripper murders than I do. And I'm asking them if this manuscript is correct, if I'm getting it right, if mm -hmm. I have studied all the right things, if I'm ignoring anything. Mm -hmm. And um, Dust and Shadow, which is my first novel, was fact-checked against really like brilliant ripperologists. Mm -hmm. And that is because they are kind enough to have taken the time yeah. to have said, yeah, I would like to tell you whether or not this is correct because I care enough about the subject. So they were awesome. Caleb Carr is on the cover of Dust and Shadow because Caleb Carr was kind enough to read it and say, I think that this person is really paying attention. And mm -hmm. um, that was the blurb that was, you know, thrown on the cover. But the Ripperologists, I gotta say, such generous use of um, their own resources. When I asked them, you know, if I could, if I could poach from them, you know, mm -hmm. and they, they helped me tremendously. So, mm -hmm. yeah forever grateful to those people. And are you, are you continuing writing Sherlock? I know it's your, your, your current book you have, that's a dog and it's not Sherlock Holmes. But. So I have a series that um, is going on at the moment that is the very first police officers of the NYPD. So like day mm -hmm. one, cop one, NYPD, Timothy Wilde is one of the first um, New York City police officers. After you write Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper, what do you do next? Right. Do you put him on the Titanic? I mean, it was an iceberg. So this is always my answer to this question. It's almost impossible to do it again. Yeah. Although, with the, 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 I, I, I'm brewing a, a, a sort of a funnier one with the Holmes on the, on the Crippen case. Oh, that would be fun. Well, because everybody in the world that Crippen knew was going to use the track. <laughs> it was all of them needed. It was all of them needed at the time. That would be completely fun. And the one, um, the one novel idea that I have for Sherlock Holmes that I won't write for probably, I don't know, like 10 or 20 years, but uh, if I write a Sherlock Holmes novel again, it's going to be Sherlock Holmes in World War One, and it's going to be Watson, clearly already, we know he was a liar, so yeah. um, so he was definitely with Sherlock Holmes during all those Altamont um, exploits, mm -hmm. and it would be Sherlock Holmes as a super spy in the first movie. I've been, World I've been toying with that too. Yeah. Perhaps we should collaborate. Perhaps so. Uh, it's like a pretty good idea though, right? Oh, it certainly is. Yay! Yeah, we could have Watson encounter Mata Hari. Yeah. Oh, man. Mata Hari. Well, yeah, the man of experience, with the experience of living on three continents. Something Conan Doyle hardly John, ever touches. three continents, Watson. Yeah. Well done. Yes, I, yeah, I would love to write that book at a certain point. Um, but I don't know when I will have the opportunity because now I'm talking about more you know, the people that I made up in my head. Well, that's what you have to do as a writer, is go with what they want. Yeah. What the characters want. Yeah, that's true. And 
Yeah. I, I am trying to write a collection of Sherlock Holmes short stories now, and it's driving me crazy. Are you writing them just from the beginning, like, I'm creating all the short stories? And oh, no, no. I mean, I, I write the way I always write, you know. I, no, I mean, like, do you already have the short stories and you're compiling them, or are you writing them, like, from the beginning? I'm, I'm, but whenever I get an idea for a story, there are certain things that crystallize in my head. Several, you know, two or three, you know, scenes that have to be written, and then I write those first. Mm -hmm. And then I take a look at the tentpoles. This is what I always call tentpoles. Circus tentpoles. That's exactly that's a, that's a good term for it. Who steal that? Circus tentpoles. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, you have to fill in. And then you have to work backwards and, and fill in what's missing, mm -hmm. and forwards to the logical and hopefully satisfying conclusion. Yeah. Well. And I can, t I can do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I can do that in forty or fifty pages, but the uh, Conan Doyle length is about twenty. The Conan Doyle length, I don't know how many pages it is, but it's seven thousand words, approximately between seven and seven, seven and, and a half thousand words between seven and ten, generally. And yeah. like I would say that seven thousand words is really lean for a Sherlock Holmes mystery, and so this is one of the reasons that I actually struggle writing for the Strand Magazine because I write for the Strand Magazine periodically. Sherlock Holmes pastiches, and they um, they want me to land at five. So mm -hmm. five thousand words as opposed to seven thousand words mm -hmm. is just not as atmospheric. It, it isn't. You know, I, 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 I need I need more space. You know, because I my yeah, my, my, my writing. I, most of you know me as a reporter. Those of you who watch the show regularly, of course, Mom, you, you know. <laughs> and, but you know, the journalism is great for your discipline. It's great for getting all the facts right at once, but you also write a lot sure. of short sentences. And right. Conan Doyle never wrote a short sentence, and that's... I don't think Conan Doyle wrote many short sentences, no. No. He did not. And I have a hard... That, that, that's one of the reasons it took 20 years to finish playing of Dracula. Yeah. Because having to get that voice right, going back and... No, no, that's me, it's not Conan Doyle. Oh, brevity. You were erasing your own brevity. <laughs> yeah. That was amazing. Well, also trying to do it without making it look like padding. And it's very hard, very hard to do. Writing in yes. someone else's voice is not just stealing characters and making things up. Writing in someone else's voice takes work. It's really li li like being a literary actor. Writing in someone else's voice, as someone who has been acting um, for a very long time, I will say I find it much more similar to acting than I do to any other kind of writing. Because mm -hmm. um, if you're trained as a mimic, you know, and you say, "Oh, look, these are these are certain qualities that you have. This is a speech pattern that you have. This is blah 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 blah." Um, all of that, in the acting sense, is extremely valuable for you as an actor. But as a writer, I think that that has been, for me personally, even more valuable because mm -hmm. now I can look at people's style and I can say, "Okay, I'm gonna just read this over and over again before I sit down to write." And I'm going to just live in this voice, and I'm going to try to get the cadence just so that it's in my head, and it is the only voice that I'm using, and it's not mine. I didn't know you acted. Would I have seen you in anything? Uh, well, goodness, I have no idea. Uh, probably the biggest things I've ever done was I was um, Ashley Judd standing <laughs> <laughs> for for a film she was working on with Jim Caviezel mm -hmm. in San Francisco. This was a very long time ago. And uh, I also did a lot of musical theater. I worked for San Francisco Mind Troupe, San Francisco Theater Company. Um, I was Lavinia in the world premiere of Andrew Lippo's The Little Princess um, about 10 years ago uh, in Mountain View. California, uh, yeah, at Theater Works, and I, I love all the people that I've done in that movie, but um, at a certain point, I think I just decided that I didn't feel like I was autonomous enough, mm -hmm. and I was always standing in front of people who were saying, you get to do this or you don't, and at a, writing my own stuff for me now makes sense, yes. uh, and it, I think that the best advice you could possibly give to anybody who's in the performance industry is to make your own stuff regardless. Like, don't just audition for things. Make your own things and yeah. put yourself in them and do that. Yeah. And you will feel like an actual human as opposed to somebody who's walking 
into an audition room yeah. <laughs> over and over and over again. And, you know, either succeeding or not succeeding, but either way, you're going to be unemployed again in six months. So just mm -hmm. make your own work. And, like, that's so hard. And yeah. it's so much work. But I think it's the best thing that you could possibly do for your own mental health. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, never, I've, I've never been an actual actor myself, but I've been interviewing years. It's, it's, it's fun to get to go in on technique and things. You know, I, I don't know Some of them are making it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> They're talking about that. technique. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they are. They, they are. But I interviewed David Strait there once. Oh my god, I love him. Are you yeah. kidding me? I, I am not. David, David Strait there. Oh god. Yeah, I, yeah the, when I was working for the uh, New Hampshire Union Theater at the time, and David, David's next movie was being filmed there. After, after, after Good, Night, Good Night and Good Luck, the Oscar nomination. After just, Good Night and Good Luck. Yeah, oh, the one he did right after that. Yeah, he got the, he got the news about the Oscar nomination he, like the day before I talked to him. But I had to ask him about Dolores Claiborne. Of course you did. Because I knew if that I were, guy. If I, I grew up with guys like really. That, yeah, that was most one of the most authentic portrayals of, nor of a northern New England you know, in North low life as I've ever seen. That's awesome. He had the accent perfect. He had the attitude perfect. He scared me to death. Yeah. And he said he, he just remember, he just remembered spending summers in New England and drew on drew on his memories you know, to get the voice and the characteristics down. What's the brilliant one? David's straight there is in. I'm forgetting the title. Um, Robert Redford. Um, oh. Uh, where David Strathairn, he's blind. Oh, oh, sneakers. Sneakers. Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the scene. Sneakers. Driving the van. Sneakers is the best movie in the entire world <laughs> ever to happen, hands down. I'll tell David that the next time I see him. Okay, thank you. And I actually might. Please sure. tell him I said that. I will. Sneakers is the best movie ever to happen. Well, it was very nice to be chatting. Yes. Yay. Yes.